In this video, we're going to be playing a little bit of catch up to cover some work that we've done to the car over the years, but hasn't really been in a video before. Some of these clips are fairly old, and I just never really found a place to fit them into a different video. And once we're caught up on all that, there's some more recent work that we did that we'll be covering too. We'll start back in February of 2018 when we were first setting up the supercharger for this engine. For a quick recap, originally this car came with a Chevy 305, but it was gone when the previous owner purchased it and he installed a Chevy 350 rebuild from eBay. I wasn't able to get much information about this engine and one thing I always wanted to know were the cam specs. It always seemed like a near stock cam because the idle speed could be set very low and it would still idle smoothly with a lot of vacuum. But since we don't have a part number for it, without removing the camshaft from the engine, it can be tricky to get information about it. What you're seeing in these clips is us measuring the camshaft lift. Specifically, not the advertised lift, but the total lobe lift. With a valve cover removed, we have placed a dial indicator against one of the rocker arms. The pintle of the indicator is in line with the pushrod and up against the dimple in the rocker arm where that pushrod tip sits. This test probably won't be 100% accurate since this engine uses hydraulic lifters, and it's a bit tricky to get that dial indicator totally in line with each pushrod. But it should be accurate enough to get us some numbers for the lift of the camshaft, and from there we'll make a guess at the other profile characteristics. So with our dial indicator in place and zeroed on a closed valve, we'll use a wrench to turn the engine until that valve hits fully open. On the pushrod side of the rocker arm, the cam lobe will push up and the reading will decrease. We took readings this way a few times on the intake and exhaust valves of the number 2 and number 4 cylinders. Here are the results, and other than that number 4 exhaust valve reading, everything seems okay. It's possible that that cam lobe is damaged, but I don't think it is, and more likely it was just not a great reading. Either way, that number is out of whack and won't tell us what profile the camshaft is supposed to have, so we'll use the reading we took on cylinder number 2. Since we were measuring total lobe lift, which is the difference between the base circle side of the cam and the tip of the lobe, we'll have to convert that into a valve lift number, which is how most camshafts are advertised. These cylinder heads use factory style stamped steel rockers, which are a 1.5 ratio. That's the most common ratio, but it's still a good idea to measure the rocker arms yourself and make sure it's correct for your engine. So we'll take that ratio to convert the lobe lift from the cam into valve lift that we can more easily use. And with that, it looks like our camshaft is somewhere in the realm of 370 thousandths intake valve lift and 410 thousandths exhaust valve lift. Looking around for a likely match, we found this camshaft in the Crane Cams catalog. According to them, it's the equivalent of a factory camshaft that makes around 300 horsepower in a 327 cubic inch small block Chevy. This isn't necessarily the exact camshaft we have, and the gross valve lift that we measured is a pretty common grind, but a factory style camshaft like this sounds about right. From all the driving before the supercharger, it definitely idled and felt like a stock style camshaft. After our initial measurements on the pushrod side, we took some more measurements on the valve side of the number 4 cylinder. And that measured out to 380 thou for the intake and 425 thou for the exhaust. These numbers are a little bit higher, but still within the realm of our previous estimates. It also tells us that our previous measurement for the number 4 exhaust valve was indeed erroneous and everything appears okay. Between our two different measurements and our estimates, this is probably a factory style camshaft or is maybe just a touch more aggressive. This method of measuring won't tell you exactly what camshaft you have, but if you're like me and just curious, this will get you within the ballpark. So we reinstalled our valve cover, tightened down the bolts, and got on with our work. Here we are just a few days after that, still in the early days of the supercharger build, and we're going to kind of, sort of, partially address one of the big issues that we had with this installation. This was covered in a fair bit of detail in a previous episode, but when we installed the intake manifold and tried to torque down the bolts, several of the bolt holes in the intake manifold cracked around their perimeter. I believe this was a combination of several factors, but the most important, biggest, and obvious one is just that the bolt holes were cast far too thin to begin with. 
The split lock washers weren't really helping, but I also didn't have enough room to fit a regular washer and I could have cut one down and this and that, but this is what happened. Most of these cracked before even getting them to the torque specs supplied by Wyand themselves. And really, I don't think anything would have helped here. The only real way to fix this would probably be to remove the manifold, bolt it to something flat, and use a TIG welder to add material around the outside of each of these holes. That was, and still is, the plan for the future, but back in 2018 we just had to make do with what we had, and I was, and am, convinced that those cracks aren't really a threat to the sealing ability of the manifolds, so we decided to make some small custom hold downs. The idea was to give a wider surface area for the bolt to clamp down on, and especially for this front bolt hole, to wrap around the outside of the manifold and prevent any pieces from actually breaking off. And to make this first hold down tab, we started with a flat piece of 16th inch thick steel. We'll clamp it in the vise and hammer it into a 90 degree angle. And with it flipped sideways, we'll cut some notches in it so that we can bend different angles into the steel. We did some basic planning on this shape, but a lot of this was just kind of freeform. And after bending an approximation of what we were looking for, we drilled a hole in it for the bolt to pass through. And after a coat of paint, here are two of the little hold down tabs that we built for this manifold. This is the tab we made for that front passenger side bolt hole, which is the worst of the bunch. The other most worrying one is the passenger side rear bolt hole that also looks like it is trying to break off. And with the bolt removed, we'll install our tab, reinstall the bolt, and get it finger tight. And we'll do the same thing with the frontmost bolt. And after getting things started, for that front bolt, we switched over to the torque wrench. The instructions call for a final torque of 30 foot-pounds. I believe we got most of the bolts to something more like 25, so that's what we'll aim for here. And unlike the last time, we actually managed to get there. Of course, we were very carefully watching what was going on in case something went wrong. For the rear bolt, we couldn't quite get a torque wrench in there and just tightened it using a regular old combination wrench, watching it very carefully. And after making these two little tabs, I don't know how much of a difference they actually made, in all likelihood probably none, but I wanted to at least try to do something about the cracks. And now that very nearly two years have passed, we can go check up on these cracks and see that none of them have really expanded. Our tabs are still in place and may be a little bit bent from tightening down the bolts, but looking okay. As far as I've been able to tell, we haven't had any issues with vacuum, water, or oil leaks from the intake manifold. We decided to sit on those clips that we recorded of measuring camshaft lift because they didn't really seem to fit into a previous episode. But this little clip of the intake manifold tabs, honestly I decided to sit on it and not mention the intake manifold cracks again because there were a lot of dire and some not very nice comments left on that video about it. Yes, a lot of the things we do on this channel are not necessarily ideal. We're just trying to make things work with the time, money, tools, and knowledge available to us, and in this case that meant leaving this cracked intake manifold installed since it didn't seem likely to me that it would cause immediate sealing issues. And maybe that was the right judgment call, or maybe we just got lucky here. Either way, it seems like the cracks haven't caused any farther problems. Though, with that being said, the next time this intake manifold is off, we will try to do something to correct it. Another thing we found that needed correction was, about a month later, we noticed a clunk from the exhaust, and when we looked, we found an issue with one of the exhaust hanger grommets. The passenger side hanger looked good, but we noticed a problem with the driver side hanger, and that problem was... uh, it's gone. At some point, the bolt holding it in must have worked its way loose and fallen out. So that entire exhaust pipe was just held on by the headers at the front and the exhaust hanger behind the muffler. I had trouble finding a good, cheap replacement grommet, so for the time being I just found a similar sized bolt and cut out some rubber washers to act as insulators. Just on the off chance that it might help, we put some red Loctite on the bolt and tightened it into the body. In hindsight, I probably tightened that down a little bit too much because it was really squishing those rubber washers. But this temporary solution worked out pretty well, and it's still holding the exhaust on to this day. The washers aren't looking great, and the ones under the bolt head are, well, missing, but it's at least still holding the pipe up. In the meantime, I did end up with a proper grommet for it, and we'll install one of those somewhere down the line. And from there, we'll jump forward to September of 2018, where we made a modification to our hood scoop. 
or bug catcher, or car guy repellent, or whatever you'd want to call this thing. We originally installed this at the beginning of 2016, when all we had was a slightly taller than usual intake that required some hood clearancing. I decided I might as well go for something very 70s and a bit tacky and ordered this thing. We ran it for a while with the decorative front butterflies hooked up, but after installing the supercharger when we switched from an Edelbrock to a Holly carburetor, I didn't feel like dealing with it again. For a while the car just had the air cleaner, and then we reinstalled the scoop, but not the butterflies. But with just those empty circles, it looked a bit odd, and I wasn't a fan. I bought an offcut of this stainless steel perforated sheet off of eBay, cut out a cardboard template to match the front of the hood scoop, then just used tin snips to cut that perforated sheet into shape. It's not perfect or the neatest looking thing, but it should be good enough. Then we added some holes for the mounting screws, and attached it to the hood scoop with some stainless hardware. And I think it looks good! It was a cheap, easy way to transform the look of the car, as well as keep the large bugs, at least, out of the hood scoop. And with that done, we're finally caught up with the previous episode of the series, which we ended with a not insignificant 175 mile drive in the car. Pretty much immediately after this drive, we decided to change the oil in the car. It had been a while, and while not that many miles had gone by, it has done a lot of sitting, so it seemed like it would be a good idea to change the oil. I think by now we've done this enough times on this channel that you get the idea, but real quickly, we'll jack up the front of the car, set it down on jack stands, remove the drain plug and drain out the old oil, which doesn't look too bad, it's a little bit dark, but not crazy. We'll go ahead and torque the drain plug to 20 foot-pounds, then remove the old oil filter, pre-fill the new one, and install that. And with the new one tightened down, we'll refill the engine with approximately 5 quarts of 5W30. Since this engine uses a flat tappet cam, we also use a ZDDP zinc additive to help make sure that it'll live a long life. Just for kicks, we decided to open up the old oil filter. There are purpose-made tools for this that'll make it a lot easier than shown here, but on this channel, as you well know, we like to do things the hard way. So we'll use a hammer and chisel to cut through the steel body of the filter and get to the element inside. I've gone through quite a few of these AC Delco PF454 oil filters over the years, but this is the first one that I've totally taken apart. Considering the price of these, I was actually a little surprised at how the construction seems pretty good. And here's a close-up look at the filter element. Some of these pieces, like those blue dots, are probably just paint flakes from the outside of the filter, but most of the rest of this was probably inside the engine. Those little red dots are from the high heat RTV coating that we gave the previous intake manifold gaskets installed on the car. There are some shiny specks and also quite a few colored ones, I, I don't know what the heck that yellow one is, but I'm not too worried about any of this. For the amount of time and miles this filter was in the car, as well as the engine part changes it's gone through, none of this is terribly surprising. I hope none of those little metal specks are from bearings inside the engine, but who knows? I don't think there's really anything worth worrying about. Something that is of concern, and has annoyed me ever since installing the supercharger underneath this hood scoop, is just kind of how flexible and bouncy the whole scoop is. You can see that by applying just a little bit of pressure, the whole thing flexes. This is due to the stamped steel base that connects the scoop to the carburetor. Before the supercharger swap, we were using an aluminum spacer that was much more rigid and the scoop stayed put. But to keep things as low profile as possible, we had to switch to the stamped steel one. To try to help out here, we're going to make a simple little bracket that connects the hood scoop to the base of the carburetor. Right now, that stamped steel base is only held on by the air cleaner nut. We'll use some cardboard-aided design and cut out a piece in about the right size and shape that our bracket should be. And we'll cut a piece of strap aluminum to match that. We drilled a mounting hole in each end, then we clamped that piece of aluminum into the vise to bend it. From my experience screwing things up, a 90 degree bend in aluminum strap like this is going to need a little bit of heat applied to prevent it from cracking. So we'll heat up the area that we'll be bending with a torch and use a mallet to get it into shape and we'll repeat that same process for the other end of the bracket. Now we'll let that cool down, and the next thing we need to do is test fit it. But before we got to that, and while we were here with the hood scoop removed for test fitting, there's another carburetor related issue to take care of. For a while now, the fuel bowl and accelerator pump gaskets had been slowly seeping out gas. 
I never noticed any dripping or anything like that, but there was some residue around the edges of the gaskets that was visible. So while we're here, we should probably address this potential safety issue. We'll leave the carburetor bolted to the blower and loosen up the fuel inlet and the front bowl screws. With the bolts out, we can pop the whole thing free of the carburetor and remove the metering block gasket. There was some residue left behind by this red gasket, so we'll use a razor blade to carefully clean that surface. The fuel bowl cover was pretty stuck to the metering block and it took some persuasion to separate the two. Actually, quite a bit of persuasion. But eventually they popped apart and we were able to remove the gasket. The last time we rebuilt this carb, we reused these gaskets, so it's not incredibly surprising that they're leaking now. We also have a new accelerator pump diaphragm, so we'll be removing the cover to get out the old one. Out comes the old diaphragm, and in goes the new one. Make sure to install it the right way round. We'll make sure all four of the pump cover screws are nice and tight. Then we'll install our new, this time blue, fuel bowl cover to metering block gasket. These new gaskets are JEGS branded, and I went with them because, well, they were the cheapest thing I could find. They're also supposed to be non-stick and reusable, but we'll have to wait until the next time we take the thing apart to test that out. We'll apply the new metering block gasket and reinstall everything onto the carburetor body. We'll line everything up and reinstall the fuel bowl screws. Last time we switched to nylon washers for these, which was a fantastic move, and I never want to use anything else. And once we have the bolts all snug, we'll go around a few times in a crisscross pattern to tighten them all down. After some of the previous experiences with Holly carburetors, I don't really want to rely on a torque spec, so I'm just going by feel here. The specs that Holly provides might work for their newer, totally aluminum carburetors, but for these older zinc and whatever else alloy ones, it seems like they're kinda soft. Once the bowl is back on, we'll thread back on the fuel feed line. Then we'll repeat that exact same process, minus the accelerator pump, for the rear fuel bowl. And of course, once that's tightened down, we'll go back and tighten down the fuel feed line flare nuts. And now that the rest is back together, we can put on our hood scoop brace. It looks a little bit different now than the last time you saw it, this is because it needed a few alterations. I mean, it's now strategically bent around the fuel level plug, and the bend helps give everything a bit of rigidity. It was definitely planned, and not because I mismeasured the bends at all. Anyway, we'll tighten that down to both the carburetor and the hood scoop, and get the rest of the hood scoop bolts back installed. And once all of them are tight, we can check to see what kind of a difference the brace made. I'm applying a lot more force than I was for the first test, as you can see by the engine and whole car moving there, but now the thing feels totally sturdy. After installing this brace, when sitting and idling in traffic, I'm not watching the thing bounce up and down the whole time. It seems almost as solid as it did before with the cast aluminum base. So for a quick little addition, I think the brace was a good upgrade. And next, we have another quick job where we'll fix something that was really bothering me. We replaced the steering center link back in 2017 with an AC Delco part. But after that, just a few months later, the boot for the idler arm joint just fell apart. The boot seems much too tall, like it wasn't even right for this to begin with. I searched around to see if I could find a proper replacement, but I was having a bit of trouble and at the time I wasn't able to find one. This is probably supposed to have some kind of tall ceiling washer like the driver's side has for the pitman arm, but I wasn't able to find the part I was looking for, so we'll have to make do. We'll start by separating the joint and removing the remnants of the old boot. First up is the cotter pin. We'll bend it straight and pull it out of the stud. Then we'll loosen the nut until it's flush with the top of the stud, but not remove it entirely. At this point, we just reached in and grabbed the boot with pliers, and it came right off. That was definitely not sealing anything. We'll install a two-jaw puller onto the idler arm and tighten it down until the joint pops loose. Now we can fully remove that nut and separate the center link from the idler arm. For better access, for the moment we'll just push the idler arm out of the way. We'll just use a paper towel to get the joint and the area around it as clean as possible. Hopefully we can remove any contaminated grease and save this joint. Since I wasn't quite able to find the seal I was looking for, I stumbled upon these polyurethane boots while they were on sale for just a couple dollars, so I figured they'd be worth a try. Just dropping them into place, the sizing seems about right, but they're a bit too tall. 
So we just took a pair of tin snips and cut the boot to make it a little bit shorter. At this point, it was little more than just a flat washer. But we popped the center link back into the idler arm and it seemed like it was going to fit. So we reinstalled the castle nut, torqued it down, reinstalled the cotter pin, and added grease. In hindsight, I think I could have cut even more off of that boot. But it seems like it's doing its job. It appears to be sealing just fine. For about a year, and now the seal is totally MIA. Since that initial attempt at replacement didn't go all that well, I did manage to track down some foam washer type seals, so we went ahead and ordered a bunch of them. Since they're hard to find, I figured they would be something good to have around. And we went ahead and installed one on the car. Only time will tell how this seal will do, but it matches the Pitman arm seal which is still in place and doing just fine, so fingers crossed. Another area of the car with issues is where the alternator belt passes by the radiator hose. This fitment issue didn't have to exist and it had to do with the way we set up the drive system for the supercharger even though we didn't have to. Anyway, you might remember that we welded this piece of steel to a hose clamp to prevent the radiator hose from getting rubbed through if the belt happened to hit it. And clearly the guard has been doing its job. At certain RPMs, usually around 2500 and under load, the belt has just enough shake to it that it hits that guard and makes a sound that was really concerning me for a while before I finally realized what it was. We found the belt was also a little bit loose, but when we tried to tighten it, the alternator bracket pretty much totally gave up. This is the Summit alternator bracket that we installed with the supercharger setup, and even shaved a little bit off the alternator to make that fit. But the steel of the bracket is so thin, and the way the slot is designed to be on the corner of it is not really conducive to the thing doing its job. And as you can see, in my efforts to keep the alternator from slipping on this bracket, we've chewed it up and bent it fairly badly. So all the more reason to redo this accessory bracket setup in the future. Also, just in the sense of doing a general checkup, the transmission fluid is still looking a little bit dark, but it's working fine so far. The transmission probably has quite a few miles on it, and the supercharger is not helping anything. Another thing we checked up on, and we've actually done this two or three times since installing the supercharger, is the blower drive pulley runout. We had a lot of trouble getting this pulley to line up the way it's supposed to, and to get it there we had to stack together four spacers which obviously is a little concerning for something that has to spin pretty fast and have not a small amount of force upon it. If this pulley got off center, not only could it start throwing the supercharger belts, it could do some damage to the crankshaft bearings. But what do you know, after about a thousand miles, the runout on this pulley hasn't changed. There's still only around seven thousandths of an inch total runout. And that number also includes some amount of the crankshaft bearing clearance. So it seems like the pulley hasn't moved at all since we tightened it down, which means we're in good shape there. And that's pretty much the point we're up to with this car. As of the upload date of this video, we've put around 1500 miles on the car since installing the supercharger, and around 6000 miles since I purchased it in 2014. The car still runs and drives really well, and in fact, in the last week, I took it for an almost 4 hour round trip drive. I was trying to get some at least half decent audio recordings of the car because it had been pretty difficult in the past. And while it did, again, prove difficult, you can get a pretty good idea of how the car sounds. At one point I ended up on an empty road and decided to do a 0-60 to run. 
I launched it pretty soft and did get to wide open, but took my time getting there as you can see from the throttle lever. Because of the 2.42 rear gears, it's not the fastest thing around. That 0 to 60 run was somewhere in the realm of 7 seconds, though it's a bit hard to tell since the speedometer doesn't work so well when you accelerate rapidly. It's worth noting that even in that clip, the engine RPM barely got past 4000. That's another effect of those highway gears. Anyway, this car was never meant to be a speed demon, I just wanted it to be fun to drive. And with that in mind, I am very satisfied with the car as it currently sits. It sounds cool, drives easily, cruises well, and has enough power, certainly on the highway, for some get up and go. When I first purchased the car, it was quite a while before I could feel comfortable driving it around and not expecting it to break at every second. And after installing the supercharger, that kind of reset, and it took a while, but I'm very much back trusting and feeling comfortable with the car. And with that, I think we're about done with this project. I mean, there are small improvements for sure, but I finally have the supercharged car I always wanted and it drives really well, so I just don't think there's anything else to do with it. And uh, oh, what's that? Oh, a big block. Yeah, I have always wanted a big block. You know what? Screw it. Let's get a cheap, rusty 454 and throw it together with a parts bin cobbled together supercharger and see what happens. It's going to be a heck of a lot of work, and even done super cheaply, more money than I've ever spent on a car before. So was all the previous tinkering, all the work on this car, worthless? Was it meaningless? I gotta say, absolutely, inequivocally, no. Not only will we take all of the knowledge and experience that we got on this project and use that moving forward, but that was all just a, a chapter an act in the story of this car, in the story of us just wrenching on this car and making it work. And who knows what challenges, adventures, surprises, and mistakes await as we get ready to take this car apart again and embark once more on another journey.